Welcome to the second virtual Johnson County Master Gardeners team program. I'm Doug Garretts. Most of you know me as vice chair of the steering committee and editor of the Johnson County Master Gardener Times newsletter. I'm serving as moderator and Shannon Bailicki is our meeting host. We're just getting started uh, with these virtual events, so we appreciate your patience in case we have any technical problems. Hopefully we won't. Some housekeeping before we begin and a reminder to participants, this presentation is being recorded by City Channel 4 for rebroadcast, so please keep your microphone muted during the presentation. Our viewers are encouraged to type questions into the ch chat feature of Zoom at any time. And that can be found in the lower part of the screen, uh, at the bottom of the screen. We will try to get to as many of the questions as we can, as time allows. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Joe Dillon, who is presenting attracting pollinators to your garden. The Lynn County Master Gardener, Joe will provide gardening tips and suggestions how to please the bees and butterflies. Human life on planet Earth is intertwined with many creatures, including pollinators. An astounding three-fourths of the world's flowering plants and about 35% of the world's food crops depend on pollinators to reproduce. Sadly, our pollinators and their habitats are disappearing. Joel will discuss what is happening to them, what steps are being taken to protect pollinators, and what gardeners can do to provide much needed habitat. Although Joe has been involved with the Master Gardener program for a number of years, like many of us, she has been more active as her time allows. In the last five years, Joe has focused her attention on pollinators. So with that, the screen is yours, Joe. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me see. Okay, so as Doug mentioned, uh, there have been times when I've been active, times when I haven't been active, and uh, but I do enjoy all the activities with the Master Gardeners. Uh, my younger sister, by the way, is also a Master Gardener in the state of Delaware, so she and I share a lot of interests. But today's presentation, I want to talk about Primarily, as Doug said, things that are happening to pollinators, who pollinators are. Some people are surprised to find out the pollinators aren't just bees and butterflies. And let's see. Okay, everybody pretty much knows what pollination is. It's the transfer of pollen from one plant to another of the same kind. Who are the pollinators? Well, they're primarily insects, as Doug said, about 90% of pollinators are insects. And this includes bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, wasps, and ants. <laughs> Pollination occurs not just during the day, but also at night. So we have uh, the moths and the bats that help with that. Uh, a number of the pollinators go through what's called a complete metamorphosis from egg to larva to pupa, pupa to adult. Uh, their lifespan isn't that long and their range is usually very short. Among the bees, we have the honeybees, and these are 
bees that uh, are not native, they're colony bees, as are the bumblebees. Honeybees have the uh, distinct privilege of getting trucked from one side of the country to another to pollinate important crops, fruits, and nuts. The bumblebees are a native colony bee. Uh, the colony does not overwinter, only the queen overwinters for bumblebees. The rest of the colony dies out before winter, so you have a new colony each year. Most of our bees, though, are what are called solitary bees. These include bees like carpenter bees, mason bees, leaf cutter bees. Uh, they either nest in the ground or in cavities, and they rarely travel more than two to 300 yards from home. There's over 300 species of solitary bees in Iowa alone. Butterflies and moths also make up our pollinators, as do hummingbirds and bats with uniquely shaped proboscis to get into trumpet-shaped flowers. Bats typically are pollinators in tropical regions. So what's happening to the pollinators? Well, for honeybees, you've probably heard about colony collapse disorder. That's just one of the problems facing honeybees. And this chart shows the loss. Um, acceptable winter loss is the light colored bar. The total winter loss that's been happening is the yellow bar and the orange bar is the total annual loss. And as you can see, it's been on the rise for several years. Um, monarchs aren't faring very much um, better either. This is a uh, slide that shows a general decline in the overwintering sites in Mexico, which is where our monarchs tend to go. And that's because of loss of habitat for one, as well as climate change, which contributes to loss of habitat. Also, overall, uh, all of the insects have been showing a collapse. And here's a chart that shows that. So this includes ladybirds, bees, ants, Flies, those are also pollinators. So, why are we seeing a problem with pollinators? Well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, habitats change. Now they change through acts of nature, like the duratio that we had. They also change because of human intervention. Back before Iowa became a state, it had a diverse prairie, marshland, woodland, oak savanna habitat. Lots of habitat, lots of food for the pollinators. Today, it looks more like this. It's more of a monoculture, and that's not only crop monoculture, that's also confined animal feeding operations, the loss of family farms consolidation into factory farms leads to monoculture as well. Another reason is urban development. We have cities, we have suburban urban sprawl, also development along rivers, streams, coasts, and waterways. All of this serves to reduce habitat. 
Another problem is the introduction, not only intentionally, but also accidentally, of non-native insects. These tend to displace and or feed on native pollinators. Uh, ladybird beetles, European weevils, Asian giant hornets are just some of those uh, non-native insects. Also the introduce, introduction of parasites and diseases like the varroa mite and the hive beetle. Another contribute to, contributor to loss of habitat and to uh, loss of food is climate change. Climate change has a specific effect on insect species like butterflies that have a very narrow uh, habitat requirements. They can't easily move to new suitable habitats. This also affects birds, bats, and all of the pollinators. Remember, pollination occurs at night as well as during the day. So light pollution means a loss of habitat for nocturnal pollinators like fireflies and bats. Another contributing factor is the use of pesticides. Uh, a fairly well-known case occurred back in the 1970s to blueberries in Canada. In the 1970s, blueberry farmers in New Brunswick, Canada saw a sudden and rapid decline in their harvest because of the disappearance of bees that had pollinated those crops. And the bees disappeared because there was aerial spraying of an insecticide onto adjacent woodlands that killed the bees. It took three years for the bees to come back to the level where they could bring the harvest back up to the level it had been. So herbicides also kill uh, not only the types of weeds farmers want to do in, but also the weeds that some of the pollinators use as food sources. A final contributing fact is genetically modified crops. Uh, you have insect res resistant crops. The plants are altered to produce their own defenses. Well, that takes care of the uh, pests for the crops, but that also takes care of cabbage worms. Uh, it takes care of the larvae of various pollinators. And the herbicide resistant uh, crops um, tend to uh, kill the weeds. So is this really the end? Albert Einstein said, if the bee disappears from the surface of the earth, man would have no more than four years to live because of the importance of insects as pollinators. No pollinators, no plants. So bees pollinate 70 out of 100 major crops. These include fruit, nuts, vegetables, and uh, crops that are considered like grains. Overall, 67% of plants are pollinated. So what does that affect? Well, it affects our food, both directly and indirectly. Directly, plants are comprised one third of human food. They must be pollinated to reproduce. And indirectly, plants are food for animals that we consume. Other products depend upon pollinators as well. We have oils, fibers, fuels, beauty products, and medicines. Approximately one fourth of modern drugs are derived from plants. And also planet health. 
Flowering plants, trees, other plants produce breathable oxygen. Fewer pollinated plants means higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and more carbon dioxide means more global warming. There is an economic impact to the loss of pollinators. Pollinators indirectly contribute to 235 to $575 billion of our economy. Actually, about 15, more than 15 billion of that is contributed to honeybees alone. And finally, why do we want pollinators? Well, we love pretty plants. And this is a uh, photo of Knoll Ridge Garden here in Cedar Rapids several years ago. Well, what is being done? Well, fortunately, a lot of attention is being paid to the plight of pollinators. So first of all, researchers are looking for alternative pollinators to the European honeybee. They're looking for ways to make croplands more attractive to the native bees that we have, bumblebees and the solitary bees. They're finding out that restoring wild habitat near farms helps welcome and nurture the native bees. It also makes honeybees themselves more efficient pollinators. So I've attended a number of lectures where they talk about putting prairie strips in uh, cropland, actually. 2015, the White House uh, released a Pollinator Research Action Plan, and part of that was to become I-35, to become a pathway for monarchs, and to seed milkweed along that. Part of that project is also to restore or enhance millions of acres of land for pollinators. Uh, this includes public land as well as private land, um, strips along the roadway. Iowa State University's gotten into the act, of course, with the Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium. And there are other concerned entities as well. For example, if you go out to the US Fisheries and Wildlife or DNR sites, you'll find a lot of information about pollinators. There's the USDA Monarch Butterfly Habitat Development Project. Local governments like the city of Cedar Rapids is getting into uh, initiatives for pollinators. Beekeepers and other for-profit individuals like Pheasants Forever and Trees Forever and other nonprofits, as well as a number of colleges and universities are all turning their attention to pollinators. So since there is a great amount of interest by all of the public, now is the time to act and what can we do? Well, we can learn to attract native pollinators by creating habitats where you live, create and tend larger areas with others and be a pollinator ambassador. Okay, so what is needed? A critical mass of diverse habitats, not monoculture. Now butterflies and bees generally have very similar needs as far as habitat. What do butterflies need? Well, food and water, nesting and egg laying sites, places for pupation and overwintering, and protection from both the elements and from predators. So let's take a look at foraging habitat for butterflies. 
you want to provide host plants. Those are the plants for the caterpillars, the leaves that they like to do on. You want to provide nectar and pollen plants, including flowering weeds. A diversity means at least eight to 10 species. You want ongoing blooms from the time the pollinators hatch to the time they pupate, which generally is early spring to late fall. For pollinators to support a variety, you need both open head flowers as well as trumpet shaped flowers. The University of Iowa did some research. They compared six square feet of restored prairie to 10 acres of suburban backyard. And they found that the density of the pollinators was the same, but the most important element was the diversity of plantings. So other things that butterflies need are nesting, egg laying, pupation, overwintering. Now what this means is you don't want a perfect lawn. You don't want a perfect environment where all the leaves look beautiful. You want a variety of materials. You snags, which are dead trees and stumps. You need some bare ground as well as um, cavity items for cavity nesting pollinators. You need underly debris, so protection. Uh, in the winter, you know, in the fall, don't clean up everything. Leave some of those uh, hostas and the lilies. Don't cut them down, let them lay over. Piles of dead wood help. It's going to be a little untidy. You want undisturbed ground, but it's going to be great for pollinators. And so what do bees need? Well, a lot of their needs are the same. Uh, for the uh, bumblebees, which have an overwintering queen, you need a hibernation area. You need bare ground and cavities for nests. Minimal pesticides, that applies to all pollinators. You need to provide nectar plants and moisture again. So to create habitat, plant for diversity, at least eight to 10 different varieties. You wanna include native plants, including specific plants for specific pollinators. And in my slides, I'll have some of the uh, uh, common butterflies to Iowa and their uh, food needs. You wanna think about Nests, bare ground, cavities, egg laying sites. There's advantages to using native plants. They're adapted to climate and soil conditions. They reduce the need for watering and they reduce the need for fertilizing or pesticides. They're adapted to the area. Here's an example of a bee waterer would probably work just as well for butterflies. Something where the water is shallow and it'll retain water. General pre best practices for your yard and garden are no tilling, you leave bare ground, create, provide cavities, selective weeding so that you have some undisturbed areas, Again, use the native species. No, or, or very minimal pesticides. We're talking about insect, insecticides and herbicides. And you wanna provide flowering plants for each season. That includes trees, shrubs, as well as perennials and annuals. So when we're talking about pesticide use, Use those that are least 
disruptive, and you can look at the label, you want to apply those if you're going to be using them when the pollinators are least active. That means very early in the morning, late evening, or even after dark. Don't apply when it's windy because you'd have drift or to plants that are in bloom. Here's an example of the label. And it has warning as far as what this particular pesticide would kill. Avoid these unless you're talking about house plants. These are neonex, they're weed killers, they're systemic. And as you can see, aphids, white flies, beetles, mealybugs, and other. That's quite a list of other actually. And which uh, insecticide products are neonex? There's a whole list of them. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, they include all of these lovely products, which I won't even try to pronounce. So what are alternatives to using pesticides? Well, think about, do you really need to get rid of that bug? There are a lot of friendly uh, insects, as well as the ones that are really pests. Uh, if you do, you can pick it off by hand, spray it with soap. Those darn Japanese beetles, you can get them early in the morning or in, later in the evening when they're not as active, just scoop them off into soapy water. Use native plants which are adapted to the pests we have in the area and forget perfection. Used to be, you know, when I was growing up, nobody thought about a perfect lawn. So you had clover and dandelions and whatever. It was fine as long as you mowed it. There are, all, are alternatives to that perfect lawn as well. Uh, the University of Minnesota has developed something called a bee lawn. It's uh, a mix of grass and low flowering plants that can bloom between lawn cuttings and usually includes a mix of fescues, white clover, creeping thyme, cell feel. Or you can buy just clover seed to mix in with regular grass seed. Uh, there are seed mixes. They're sold under various names such as alternative lawn or bee lawn. So we talked about providing food for uh, pollinators throughout the season. So succession planting, this would be a minimal. And if all you have are containers, they'll work too. You'd want three plants of three species for each growing season, spring, summer, and fall, which would be 27 plants. So if you just have a patio, use containers. Okay, we have some various really great trees and shrubs for pollinators. Oaks, different kinds of oaks will support 500, about 534 species of insects and pollinators. Linden, otherwise known as basswood, is a great uh, pollinator resource. There are a number of flowering fruits like plums and pears and cherries and apples and all of those that provide wonderful food. There are a lot of trees that you don't even think of for flowering that will provide food. Uh, some of those include uh, things like uh, dogwoods, hawthorn, maples, hackberry, uh, shagbark hickory. They flower too, and they usually flower at a time when not much else is flowering. Very shrubs like forsythia and beautyberry and beauty bush, lilac, all provide wonderful sources for pollinators. Willows are good too. So if you're thinking of adding trees and shrubs, uh, take a look, see what you already have and make sure you get a variety. 
If you're starting from scratch, you want to place your trees and shrubs first, and then put in the rest of your flowering plants. Here's some flowering fruits like crab apple. They provide spring blossoms and nectar. That linden basswood, multiple pollinators, bees, wasps, and beetles, all important, even though the butterflies are probably the prettiest. You also want to include grasses. These provide not only overwintering sites and nesting sites, but there are grasses that are host plants for some butterflies www.nativegrasses.com includes lists of suitable grasses for this area. You definitely want to avoid invasives. You can go online and look at what are considered invasive species in Iowa. These include loose strife and uh, Japanese, um, I'll think of it in a moment. Uh, but there are a number of plants that are considered invasive that you do not want. So plant local. There are advantages. First of all, if you plant plants that are adapted to this area, they're available from local sources. They're adapted not only to the climate, but also to the pests and to local pollinators. If you plant natives, they usually have, usually have more uh, nectar and are reproducible where hybrids may not be. So a list of perennials. Uh, there are many sites, including uh, Iowa State University, that has lists of, of flowering plants that are good for pollinators. Here's just a small list. So you have different bulbs for springtime and for fall, uh, coneflower, liatris, penstemon, joe pie weed, black-eyed susan, various weeds and grasses. Anis hyssop is a great one. Phlox, columbine, various sedums, asters, uh, monarda, there are uh, the local monarda or bee balm. And I have a list of resources uh, that you either have gotten or will get. Uh, I also have them at the end of the presentation that has places where you can not only go for lists of plants, but you can also go to buy plants. So again, planning tips. You want to mass the plants, at least three to five plants together. Pollinators are going to see these from the air. It's a lot easier to see a mass of plants. So cedar plant drifts. In new beds, you can use newspapers to give plants a head start. Mulch with leaves or straw. Uh, wood chips tend to suck nutrients out of the soil. Plus, the leaves and straw are easier to disturb. Here's an example of planting in large blocks. And this is again from Knoll Ridge Park. And this is the view, a pollinator's view from the air. This is the uh, All-American Selection Butterfly Garden several years ago. So here's the slides for a number of the uh, local butterfly pollinators that we have. Here, of course, is the monarch. Uh, the host plant assorted milkweed varieties. 
We have several different milkweed varieties, not just the common one. And then the adult food of uh, goldenrod, joe pieweed, thistle, uh, liatris, lilac, lantana. So it's the caterpillars that have that very specific um, milkweed need. The adults more varied. Here's the various milkweeds that are common to Iowa. They include common milkweed, butterfly weed, uh, swamp milkweed, world milkweed, and prairie milkweed. Here's another butterfly that is uh, common to Iowa. It's called the great spangled fritillary. It has a lot of the same food needs for the adult as the monarch, uh, milkweed, thistle, joe pie weed. Menard is one of its food sources. Beautiful butterfly. Remember, you're gonna see those caterpillars if you want the butterfly. Cabbage whites. Uh, the caterpillar loves, oops, and excuse me, there we go. Uh, cabbage, collards, broccoli, probably not real uh, popular with home vegetable gardens, but again, if you want the adult, you need to have the uh, caterpillar. Black swallowtail, lovely. And again, the caterpillar is going to eat something gardeners, vegetable gardeners don't like, parsley, carrots, dill, fennel celery, but the adults are worth it. A spring azure, as the uh, name suggests, they emerge as adults in April or early May. That's why having uh, nectar plants available that early is important. A clouded sulfur. Here we have an eastern tail blue. A painted lady. Caterpillar almost looks like the uh, same colors as the adult. Uh, again, a number of food preferences that are similar to the other butterflies. Uh, Latris, bee balm, pieweed, milkweed. Here's a colorful one called the Red Admiral. And the caterpillar has a very, very specific food source, likes nettles. The Morning Cloak. Uh, this one likes rotting fruit as an adult. So again, a variety of food sources is important. So here is diversity in action. This is one of the Lynn County, she used to be Lynn County Master Gardener and Becky Lynch. And this is her garden in midsummer. You can see she's incorporated grasses, a meadow area, shrubs, trees, has a plant diversity. She has areas that are protected from the wind. And there are, though you can't see them well in the picture, bare ground areas. Here's another uh, view of her garden. We have a log habitat pile. Well, what else can you do besides um, being very attentive? Thank you. Okay, uh, I guess I forgot to change that. 
but there are all kinds of um, webinars and forums that occur from time to time. You can become a monarch pollinator way station. Uh, the monarch research station here in uh, Cedar Rapids has available these bio tents in two sizes. These are tents specifically for um, butterflies. They come with instructions. They also have a smaller version that I'm getting that uh, fits in a, um, like a raised bed area. You can contribute time and money to one of the organizations and here's just several of them. Monarch Watch, Xerxes Society, Monarch Research Project. And speaking of the Xerxes Society, uh, I have some materials here. This one is uh, Pollinators in Iowa, a guide to bees, butterflies, moths, and beneficial insects put out by of a consortium that includes Trees Forever, Xerxes Society, and the Iowa Living Roadway Trust Fund. It's a great little pamphlet, uh, tells you about the different butterflies and bees that are common to Iowa, as well as talks about beneficial insects, some of which are also pollinators. So here's just pictures of some of the pollinators at Knoll Ridge Park. And the pictures were taken by Laura, Lori Russell and Kristen, Christy Benzine. A list of resources. These are uh, what I took some of the charts from. And then there's some recommended books. Uh, Pollinators of Native Plants by Heather Holm. We have a book called Attracting Native Pollinators. It's put out by the Xerxes Society. Again, by the Xerxes Society is a book, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. Douglas Ptolemy is a professor at the University of Delaware. He's done quite a bit of research and produced materials about uh, bringing nature home. And he has two books. One is called Bringing Nature Home and the other one is Nature's Best Hope. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, publications and sites. that reference information as well as uh, the various publications relating to pollinators. Some most of the ones from Iowa State, I'm sure you're familiar with. And then plants and nurseries that uh, provide native plants. Um, here in the Cedar Rapids area, there's Bloom's Garden Center, Fleming Nursery, Cedar River Garden Center. I'm sure there's some in the Iowa, State, Iowa City area, uh, Ion Exchange. And then out of state, some of the better ones that we found are Blooming Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery, Prairie Nursery, and then there's one called Simply Native Nursery. So with that, um, thank you, Joe. Yeah, you're welcome. For that interesting presentation. And I uh, will stop. We have about ten minutes for questions, so mm -hmm. let's take some questions from our audience. So one of the first we have here, Joe, is are bees attracted to colors or scents? Okay, bees are primarily attracted to scents. Uh, they are attractive to some colors. Uh, let me just get my list here. Specifically yellow, blue, and white. They really can't see red if, uh, they're going for one that it may have red in the center, but uh, 
or yellow in the center, if it's a red flower and does not have a scent, it probably has either a yellow, blue, or white center, but primarily scents. So following up on that, what, what plants then would be most attracted, attractive to bees? Give us an example. Oh, uh, well, again, any that have a, a strong scent, you have, of course, your roses, lilacs. Um, gosh, it's easier for me to refer you to the references than to try to list them all. Okay, here's another question from, uh, do you know a source for bee lawn? If you do a search on bee lawn, you'll come up with not only uh, some of the seed companies that provide it. I don't know if there's a source locally here. I know you can order them online uh, University of Minnesota has quite a bit of information because they're the ones that develop that concept. Okay. Uh, do you have recommendations for monarch egg slash caterpillar predators, such as the milkweed beetle? So I'm guessing okay. some way to deal with the milkweed beetle. Oh, <laughs> um, well, again, since our recommendation is to minimize the use of pesticides, uh, if you can patrol those plants and scoop them off, that would be the primary way to do it. Okay. Uh, what native plants are easiest to plant and care for? in your experience? Uh, you know, that unfortunately depends upon a number of factors. What type of uh, soil conditions do you have? What type of uh, light conditions do you have? Um, what are you trying, are you trying to attract a specific group of butterflies or pollinators? So I honestly don't have a real, you know, a, a list for every condition, but the ones that are easiest to care for in this area are probably uh, natives like uh, Rudbeckia, your brown or black eyed Susan, the Echinacea, the, the cone flowers, the Leatris, the, the gay feathers, uh, the various monardas, the bee balm, um, yellow egg, uh, golden alexander are a great sturdy plant, um, yarrows of various sorts are good, lantana is a superb annual in this area that attracts butterflies. Those are just some of my recommendations. And then of course, you want something that spans that whole season from early spring to late fall. So asters, joe pie weed, those are good also. Uh, goldenrod will be later in the season. Um, for your early ones, lilacs are good. Those would be some of my recommendations. Okay. Uh, you showed us a number. Oh, go ahead. You showed us a number of pictures of gardens that look mostly in the Cedar Rapids area. Do you have specific uh, sites for pollinator gardens or native landscapes that you'd like to visit? No, I haven't found one that's the best as such, but there are some local um, areas around it, in our area. There's the uh, garden in uh, Clinton. Uh, there's the um, 
Des Moines Conservatory, that's a good place. Um, up in uh, Waterloo and Dubuque, there are some uh, public gardens. Davenport has some public gardens, but I really haven't found any one place that I would recommend above any other. Okay. You know, each has their own attractive areas, good areas, if you will. Um, Norwich Gardens, uh, I would have recommended three years ago. They're kind of short staffed, so it's not quite as spectacular as it was. Okay. Are there any particular preparations that a gardener would need to do in their gardens before incorporating native plants? Well, you definitely want to remove the competition as such. You want to remove the sod. If you're using native plants, you really don't need a lot of soil amendment. Again, you want to do what you would do if, for planting anything. You want to loosen the soil. Uh, you want to uh, make sure that you mulch it after you plant, but not with wood chips. Or, you know, um, leaves or whatever to keep the moisture in. Are uh, you you want to make sure you're putting the plant in the right place for its soil and light conditions, definitely. And again, um, you want to do a mass, not just one or two plants in one area. I would imagine most pollinator plants are full sun. Yes. Most pollinator plants are full sun or light shade. Okay. And you mentioned uh, insecticides. Um, do you use any insecticides? And if you do, what kind of process? I, exactly. I do not use any insecticides. I, I let them duke it out for themselves, uh, just realizing that I'm going to have, it's never going to look perfect, but uh, if you use an insecticide that, you know, takes care of one problem, you may introduce another problem. So I prefer either just, you know, mechanical control Again, if you're going to use an insecticide, follow the labels, uh, use it very judiciously. That's what I can say. Do you use any, uh, what we would consider organic or biologic? Controls? Controls? Um, no, I don't again there, and then maybe I'm just being a lazy gardener. But there are some recommended ones. Um, and let's see, I don't have a list here, uh, but it's easy enough to find a list online uh, or through Iowa State Extension. They have publications or they have lists of biological controls that you can use. Okay, we have uh, time for maybe one more question. If anybody, let's see, here's one from Shannon. Do you raise caterpillars indoors or do you focus on pollinator habitats outside exclusively? I do not. I know there are some of the master gardeners here uh, in Lynn County that have raised the caterpillars indoors and they've had good success with it. I just uh, prefer to do it outside. Okay. I 
think that puts us just about out of time. Unless okay. Final question. I don't see one coming in. So Joe, thank you again for your uh, very informative presentation. We want to also thank Shannon Balicki for hosting our education session session presentations and Iowa City's City Channel 4 for live streaming and recording this activity. And thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Visit City Channel 4 to see rebroadcast re viewing times of this presentation. A YouTube video will be posted to our Master Gardeners Facebook page and our Master Gardeners webpage so viewers can view the presentation online. Our next presentation is scheduled for Sunday, March 28th, when Deb Walser will present how to prepare for possible drought conditions. If you have gardening questions, don't forget our Hort line. Although we aren't in the office, our volunteers are still answering questions. Call the Hort line at 337-2145. That's 337-2145. Or email at Johnson County, just C O M G at gmail.com. So that's Johnson. C O M O or M G at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us. Everyone have a good afternoon.